This is Armchair History, and it's uh, we're going to be doing this program once a month, and it is put on by the Southport Historical <laughs> Society as part of our um, the, the current Southport Stay at Home and Stay Safe initiative, trying to help people uh, find interesting things to do while we're having to limit our, uh, our our interactions. And we, as always, we're grateful for the support of the Friends of the Library, who helps us get the word out about these programs through their website and their emails. So today we are going to be talking about uh, World War One on the Lower Cape Fear and in particular on Baldhead Island, uh, which was known at the time as Smith Island. So I'm gonna be talking about this little known event that happened in the final months of the war. And the reason I chose this topic is I think it's a great uh, way to talk about what life was like on Smith Island 100 years ago. And my goal is that by the end of the talk that you're gonna feel a closer connection to the people that lived there, and the challenges that they faced. So let's get started. On August 10th, 1918, the US Navy Department received a dispatch uh, from the Commandant of the 6th Naval District in Charleston, South Carolina. It seems that a Captain Willis of Smith Island Coast Guard Station had notified Colonel Chase of the Coast Artillery Corps on Fort Caswell that the island had suffered a gas attack. Um, presumably from a German U-boat. So the um, Colonel Chase then sent that report on to Charleston, who sent it on to uh, the main Navy headquarters in Washington, D.C. So the report stated that at approximately 5 p.m. on August 10th, an attack using poisonous gas had been attempted off of the North Carolina coast. And the result of the attack had temporarily put the Coast Guard station and the lighthouse personnel on Smith Island out of business. About 40 minutes after the attack, three large oil spots, each over one acre in size, were observed passing by Smith Island to the north. Now, according to the report, this oil from which the gas must have, uh, was no doubt generated, must have been released from a submarine in the vicinity of the entrance of the channel, and that the, the hope had been that it would come in with the tide and, and harm uh, Smith Island. But fortunately, the tide had run along the island and most of the gas had gone out to sea. Now, according to the report, six men had succumbed to the gas, but no deaths were reported. The gas was said to have the same effect as mustard gas, and the effects lasted about 35 to 40 minutes. At the time of the report, the color of the gas had not yet been ascertained, and its effect on trees and shrubbery had not yet been determined. So a few days later, the Committee on Public Information published excerpts from the report, and they stated that the entire matter would be investigated and promised that a full report would be made. Newspapers immediately picked up this story and they began reporting it widely. They added details, including the fact that one of the men who had succumbed to the gas was none other than Captain Charlie Swan's young wife. There was also mentioned that some livestock and chickens had been killed during the attack. So reporters questioned the motive behind the attack. I mean, could it have been an attempt to take out Bald Head Lighthouse? And if so, why hadn't the, the U-boat attacked the island directly with artillery? Or had the attack been actually intended for nearby Fort Caswell and shifting winds and tides had accidentally sent it to Smith Island instead? Could this be evidence of some new kind of warfare that the Germans were experimenting with? And then the newspapers also posed the possibility that this had not been a deliberate attack at all. It was common knowledge that when U-boat carbide batteries mixed with salt water, they released toxic fumes. So could a U-boat have run aground offshore of Smith Island and the resulting gas floated ashore? Well, within two days of the event, Josephus Daniels, who was the Secretary of the Navy for Woodrow Wilson, and he was also a North Carolina newspaper mogul, he issued a statement that to the best of the Navy's knowledge, no U-boat was in the vicinity of Smith Island at the time of the attack. 
Naval experts could not say what had caused the attack. They didn't know, but they could definitively state that the cause had not been a German U-boat. So, you may be wondering, well, if it's true that this attack was a false alarm, why are we even bothering to talk about it today? So one thing, um, the rumor that a German U-boat attacked Smith Island during World War I is persistent. Ethel Herring's book on the history of Fort Caswell, which was written in the 1980s and is still in print today, refers to the attack as a fact. But to me, the even greater reason to discuss this incident is because it's a good opportunity to understand the mindsets of the people living on Smith Island 100 years ago. One of the most challenging things for historians to do is to put aside our own perspectives and understand the worldview of the people that we're studying. So I'd like to take a little time to imagine what must have been going through the heads of the men who experienced this event and made this report. And so to do that, I'd like to look at some of the ways the world was different during World War I. So I'm sure you'll all agree that one of the things that defines our modern era is our technology. We are under a constant barrage of changes in technology. It's almost impossible to keep up. I went back 10 years just to look at what had been invented in the last 10 years. And we've seen the Apple iPad, the Google self-driving car, um, Amazon, Alexa, she's listening, um, Fitbits, and uh, virtual meeting spaces like Zoom. So incredible advances, right? And most people would say that the one thing we can say with absolute certainty about life 100 years ago is that it was a much simpler time and that it operated at a slower pace and there weren't all these technology changes to have to keep up with. We might say that, but would we be right? So World War I started in Europe in 1914. So again, I went back about 10 years from that date to see what kind of technology breakthroughs uh, they had back then. And I think that some of the ones, things that they invented back then make our present day innovations seem pretty tame in comparison. So the first technology innovation I'd like to discuss is wireless communication. So we have cell phones and text messages and Facebook and Twitter, and everyone is in near constant communication across the world. So try to imagine a world in which ships were unable to communicate with other ships or with life-saving stations on shore, but their only means of communication was within a limited range and based on being able to see flags or hear horns being blasted. So in 1897, in May of 1897, this man, Guglielmo Marconi, sent the first ever wireless communication over open sea. It went about three and a half miles, and that was a huge um, breakthrough. And then six years later, in 1903, just about 10 years before the war started, he sent a wireless message all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. It, there was a message that went from President Teddy Roosevelt. It was translated into international Morse code because this was just Morse code that was being sent. It wasn't like they were talking on the phone. And it was sent to King Edward VII in England. And this was a huge breakthrough because many people thought that uh, messages would be limited to 200 miles because of the, the curvature of the earth. So this, uh, this Transatlantic uh, communication, these advances eventually led to reliable ship to shore communication and also uh, communication between ships across great distances. And it was this invention that enabled, for example, the Titanic to call for help in 1912. Okay, so I'm sure that many of you are familiar with this advancement because it first happened right on the Outer Banks of North Carolina. So, uh, does anyone know what year the Wright brothers made the first manned flight on Kitty Hawk? Yes? I'll let somebody in. Okay, it was December 1903, again, just about 10 years before the war started. Now, that flight only went about 120 feet, and later that day, um, 
just a few hours later, there was a strong breeze that picked up the plane, flipped it over, and slammed it into the ground, destroying it completely. So it was that flimsy. Um, but yet, within just 11 years, airplanes were being used by the military to conduct surveillance, to drop bombs, and to fight in aerial combat, or what they called dogfights. So that was huge, huge technology advances in a short period of time. I do want to do a little shout out to the life-saving station. Um, this picture, this historic picture, um, was actually taken by a member of the life-saving life -saving station at Kitty Hawk. He snapped the camera. Uh, it was already pre-set up, but he snapped the camera. And uh, you can see Orville lying down on the plane and then, um, and then Wilbur running along beside it. Okay, now this is a photo of cars parked on the garrison lawn of Fort Johnston in Southport. That white building in the background is part of the garrison building uh, before it was bricked over. So if you picture the beautiful brick historic building that we have, Fort Johnston, where our museum and visitor center is, that's that building there before it was bricked. And you can just make out in the background underneath that oak tree, the Chapel of the Cross. So you can kind of figure out where these cars are parked. And, and then if you look behind the cars in the background, I personally like all the laundry hanging from the line in the background. So um, my question is, does anyone know the year the first car arrived in Southport? It's not the, not the first time someone in Southport actually owned a car, but the first time that most people in Southport actually saw a car for the first time. Anybody wanna guess? Okay, I'll tell you. Um, not in a guessing mood today. The year was 1910. So uh, a, a visitor drove up from South Carolina. And the reason I know that is it was in the newspapers in Southport when it happened. So um, a gentleman drove up from South Carolina, um, brought some friends with him to visit Southport. That was only four years before the start of World War I, when even though they were still using horses in the military, they were also using cars as um, ambulances, armored cars, military transport, and very early tanks. All right. So on this slide, the top picture shows a line of military ships from the early 1900s. And you'll notice something uh, that you don't usually, you don't see today about these ships, and that is all of that black smoke coming out of the smokestacks. And that's because they were running on coal, and that made huge black clouds wherever they went. And a coal-powered battleship burned up to 10 tons of coal every hour, and it produced dense smoke tons of ash. So not only was this a lot of pollution, and you could see them from a long way off, but it also made it really difficult to have ships because they had to restock their coal supplies so frequently. So they had to have recoaling stations set up. It was a great logistical nightmare. And then once they would get the, the coal uh, on shore, then they had to get it on the ship. And then from the ship, they had to get it down to where they needed to burn it in the furnace. So it was a lot of dirty and strenuous work and it required a lot of manpower. A lot of time was spent just moving coal. Also, it was almost impossible for the ships to refuel at sea because the ships bringing out the coal were carrying coal for their own purposes. They did, couldn't also carry coal to give to other ships to refuel. So um, providing um, the fleet with coal was one of the biggest logistical headaches during the Spanish-American War. It just was not a sustainable way to, to fight uh, a naval battle. So because the war in Europe began three years before the United States got involved, we had some time to sort of gear up before entering the war. So in 1916, the Navy commissioned its first two ships and the, that were oil-fired oil burners, oilers. The USS Nevada and the USS Oklahoma. So they ran on oil, and to resupply them, they created a new kind of ship called an oiler, and that was designed to transfer fuel while the ship was at anchor. And um, they were, uh, they could also do it when they were underway if the water, if the uh, sea was calm enough. And at one point during World War I, a single oiler refueled 34 destroyers in the mid-Atlantic which was a whole new era in maritime logistics. Instead of having to have a quarter of your fleet in 
port all the time refueling. They could refuel them right in the water uh, where they were close to the fight. So another big game changer in World War I were U-boats or undersea boats. So many people think of U-boats as submarines, but when you think of submarines today, we think of boats that travel almost exclusively underwater. But that's not what U-boats were. U-boats were actually, they actually traveled on the surface most of the time. They, uh, they used a diesel engine and they could go about 16 knots an hour, which was faster than most merchant ships, but still slower than the fastest warships. Now, they were, they were U-boats, they were undersea boats, that's what the U stands for. They could submerge and they could go about 165 feet underwater. But when they were underwater, they were traveling on a battery. Um, it's an electric motor instead of their diesel engine. So they could only go about half as fast as they could on the surface, and they could only stay submerged for about an hour. Plus, they really couldn't see where they were going. They had to use the periscope in order to see, and they really couldn't hear anything except what they could hear through the water and through the, the ship. So they were very limited when they were underwater. So unlike what we think about as um, submarines, they really didn't stay underwater that often. The biggest advantage that they had was that they could hide underwater when they saw an enemy boat. So they'd be going along on the surface, they would see an enemy boat in the distance, and that's when they would submerge. That would allow them to then sneak up on the boat and get in position before launching a surprise attack. And that helped them to be very strategic about their weapons because they wanted to be sure not to waste their torpedoes. So when we think of submarine warfare, we think of it being very reliant on torpedoes. That's what submarines do, they shoot torpedoes. But early U-boats had to use different tactics. They didn't have very many torpedoes on board, and the ones they had um, were often they were unreliable, or they weren't very effective because they, didn't, they had to maneuver the U-boat in just the right position in order to do an accurate attack. The torpedoes didn't have um, guidance systems like the ones do today. So once they launched, they were going to go wherever they sent them, and if they sent them in the wrong direction, they would just totally miss the boat. So because of those shortcomings and the fact that they only had a few torpedoes with them, um, they only used them when it was absolutely necessary and when they could expect that they were going to actually hit their target. So in addition to the torpedoes, they also had these um, one or two deck-mounted guns that they could fire at a ship, like the one you see in this picture. And they carried artillery for those guns with them. And they were not big boats, that's why there wasn't much room for weaponry, and there was only usually about 39 men on the boat. So the way, what they would usually do, um, the most effective way to attack an unarmed merchant ship, um, was by using this gun um, and shelling them with the deck guns. And then sometimes they wouldn't even have to fire their artillery at all. Because you can imagine, you're an unarmed ship, you're a merchant ship, you're just trying to deliver your cargo, you're not in the military, you just need to do your job and get to where you want to go. And all of a sudden, out of the water, this submarine comes up and it's got this big gun pointed right at you. A lot of times what they would just do is abandon ship. And the Germans would let them do that. And it sounds very um, chivalrous now. It's like, oh, they didn't shoot at them. They just let them go, which they did. But a lot of times that's because it worked to their, their benefit as well. They didn't particularly want to shoot the, the boat up out of the water. What they wanted to do was um, get on the ship. So they would let the, the crew leave. They would board the ship. They would take whatever um, they wanted from the ship. They would take food. They would take um, supplies. They would take you know, anything that would be helpful. And um, then they would plant explosives on the ship and, and sink it that way. Um, another thing that they would do is they carried mines with them. And so they would um, spend time planting mines in um, high traffic areas, like in the shipping lanes, and then they would leave. And so uh, other merchant ships would run into those uh, mines and explode, you know, get damaged or sink um, when the U-boat was, was far away. So there'd be no warning, they would just suddenly be sunk. Okay, and then the final new weapon that I was going to talk about is um, chemical weapons, and those were used extensively in World War I. Um, they came up with several different types of chemical weapons. At the beginning, tear gas was used, 
After that, a bromide gas and then a chlorine gas. And the Germans were the first ones to use the, uh, use the chemical weapons, but the Allies, including the United States, also developed and used poisonous gas. So it was uh, very prevalent in World War I. Um, by the end of World War I, more than half a million troops were injured and 30,000 were killed from, uh, from chemical weapons, including 2,000 Americans. Now this is mustard gas. It has this yellowish color. Uh, and it smelled like onions or garlic or horseradish. And you can see a poster there. They would warn the, the troops about it um, so that they know it was coming because you could see it being sh coming toward you. And um, they would try to put their gas masks on. So gas masks were invented to try to help with some of the chemical uh, weapons. Um, but they really weren't effective for mustard gas because that also caused problems, not just from breathing, the, the Gas masks were good if you were, try if you were trying to, uh, there were toxic fumes you didn't want to breathe in, or if there was smoke. But for mustard gas, that would cause problems if it came in touch with your skin. So any exposed skin, you'd get severe burns from the mustard gas. The, uh, the mustard gas was also very heavy, so it would come floating in on the breeze and then it would sink and it would cover the vegetation, the trees, the grass, it would get on everything. A lot of World War I warfare happened in trenches, and so it would sink into the trenches where the men were and they would get um, exposed to the gas. It would also cling to their clothing, so if someone, a soldier was exposed to the gas and then some other people tried to help him, they were gonna get gas on, on themselves and also get uh, chemical burns from touching their clothing. So it was um, a very, uh, very insidious kind of um, weapon. And it would be uh, distributed through artillery sh shells and grenades, uh, which were fired in the vicinity of the troops. So this is the, the type of weaponry that uh, Baldhead said had come in on the, the oil slicks uh, near, near Smith Island. So we don't hear as much about mustard gas today, and that's because it's, it's a very, uh, it's horrible uh, chemical. And in 1925, the Geneva Protocol um, prohibited the use of poisonous gas in wars. All the countries agreed they would not use it. And then in 1997, there was a uh, chemical weapon convention, and that outlawed the use of riot control agents as well, such as tear gas in warfare. So we do still hear about the use of tear gas, but that's because the United States, while we agreed not to use it on our enemies in warfare, we um, maintain, retained the right to use it on our own citizens to um, uh, control domestic disagreements. So, World War I really ushered in some new types of warfare. There was the potential for bombs to drop from the sky, for submarines to rise up uh, and appear without warning out of the water, for a boat to uh, drift into a mine, a mine to drift into a boat, um, for poisonous chemicals to come to float in the, in the air on a breeze and cover everything with acid. There was a real randomness and an indiscriminateness of this type of warfare that they hadn't seen before. And it wasn't just limited to soldiers and to specific battles. Civilians were also under attack. And attacks could be made at random. And sometimes um, the targets didn't even seem to make military sense. So all of this had the effect of eroding a sense of personal safety for the civilians. And this was very intentional on the part of the Germans. Now today we call this type of attack terrorism because it's intended to induce terror in the population. During World War I, they called it a culture of frightfulness. And you can see that on the flag in this political cartoon, it says culture of frightfulness. The Germans deliberately set out to create fright and chaos and a sense of danger so that people felt threatened even when the attacks didn't directly affect them because they reasoned, well, the next one might. So there was a, a high level of fear and concern. And it wasn't just new technologies and new types of warfare that people were having to deal with uh, about this war. There were other sociological and political hurdles. So nowadays, we're used to having a standing army. We're used to having our US military troops spread all over the world and involved in all sorts of conflicts of other countries. 
But in World War I, before World War I, that just wasn't the case. Um, it was the first time in American history that the United States sent soldiers abroad to defend foreign soil. We're so used to that now that it seems amazing that that was the first time it had happened. And we also didn't have a standing army. So on April 6, 1917, when the US declared war on Germany, we had barely any soldiers. The entire US army consisted of 127,500 soldiers and officers. And so on this chart that shows the, the size of the armies of different countries, we're right in there somewhere between Belgium and Montenegro. So by the end of the war, which was just 19 months later after war was declared, 4 million men had served in the United States Army with an additional 800,000 in other military branches. And 2 million of those men had been sent overseas. So it's a huge, huge, rapid, rapid buildup of, of a force. So this is what, this is Southport around the time that World War I started. And as you can imagine, all of those changes that we just talked about, all those things that were happening, uh, were being felt in Southport. And in addition to the technology changes, Southport overnight became a military town. Fort Caswell was one of the first two training camps in North Carolina, and over 1,500 men were sent to Fort Caswell. That's more than the entire population of Southport. So overnight, the population basically doubled, and all of it was these new recruits uh, coming in. So several times a day, a boat ran between Fort Caswell and Southport, and they brought over troops, young men who were off duty, far from home, and looking for ways to entertain themselves. So the Southport leaders, and I assume the Southport mothers, quickly realized that this could lead to no good. So they worked with the U.S. War Camp Community Service Department and they put together an Army Navy Club in Southport. And this, this club gave the young men a place to go so they weren't just loitering on the streets of Southport. They could go there, they could play cards, they could listen to music, they could read books, they could write letters, they could have snacks, and of course they could talk to the young women in town who served as hostesses many times alongside their mothers. And they could also attend the Amuse You Theater, uh, which is still standing today, and uh, it was brand new back then, and it showed several different movies a week. These were silent movies, um, but there was a, a piano player, and he would set the mood by playing music to accompany what was on the screen. And you can also see right next door to the theater, there was also a pool room. So the first men to be sent to Fort Caswell were from the National Guard, and then they were followed very quickly by the new recru recruits. These are the barracks for the enlisted men. Um, unfortunately, the fort was built to accommodate about 450 men, and as we mentioned, the, the average amount stationed at the camp throughout World War I was about 1,500. So the overflow were put into tents until more barracks could be built. And these were pretty miserable because you can imagine in the summertime, they dealt with heat and humidity and mosquitoes and sand spurs. And then the winter really wasn't any better. The winter of 1918 was one of the coldest that it was then on record in North Carolina. And the tents were heated with these, they were called them Sibley stoves that they had invented in the Civil War. This building in the front is the headquarters, and then in the back, that large building, that's the hospital. And these are some of the newly formed troops who until recently had just been regular working Joes. And these particular troops were lucky because as you can see, they're wearing uniforms. The first troops to come uh, through were asked to please bring some tan pants and some boots if possible because it was really hard for the military to gear up so quickly and even have clothes for uniforms for the men to um, to wear. So they were told bring the tan some tan pants and some boots. If you can't afford to buy those then at least please bring a change of pants and some underwear and socks because it's going to be a couple weeks before we can get you any military uniforms. And here they are on the military parade ground. 
So because the U.S. had committed to build up its troops presence so quickly, remember we went from 100,000 men to um, 4 million in 19 months, and, and 2 million of those were being sent overseas, there was an urgency about the soldiers' stay at Fort Caswell that year. They only stayed a few months, and then they were sent on to Europe. They were desperately needed on the battlefields of Europe, and so their training was very hurried and intense. And because of the rushed experience, the men were often poorly prepared for what lay ahead of them. Of course, the government was continually doing whatever it could to improve the training of the troops. So in January of 1918, the U.S. War Department proposed the construction of a rifle range next to Fort Caswell and it was to be used for small arms training of soldiers destined for overseas duty. So this picture is not of the actual Fort Caswell rifle range, but it is of one that looks very similar to what it looks like. And so you can see the targets in the background that the men would shoot, shoot at. And those are operated, um, they're on a mechanism, and they're operated by a soldier who was off to the side in a pit. And he would turn a crank and operate this mechanism and he would cause the targets to move up and down so that the men, to make it more challenging to hit, so they were shooting at moving targets. And so then these men would be, um, these armed soldiers um, would be several hundred yards north of the structure and then they would attempt to shoot at the targets and not at the man in the pit. So here's a shot of the overall compound of Fort Caswell, and it shows it was practically a little city all into itself. There was um, a hospital, there was a commissary, a bakery, a mess hall, a YMCA, a barbershop, a laundry, a brig, um, basically everything that they needed to sustain the men at the fort except really much entertainment and women. So the outbreak of World War I um, saw the responsibilities of, there was a rev, there's a revenue cutters service, uh, and it saw their responsibilities grow exponentially. And so as the conflict spread, President Woodrow Wilson decided to take the revenue cutter service and uh, combine it with the U.S. Life Saving Service and put all the assets and the personnel, the boats, the people, everything together. And he was going to put these two agencies together and put them in charge of guarding the nation's shores, both by land and by sea. And so in 1915, he signed the act to create the Coast Guard, combining both services into one military agency and for the first time establishing the U.S. Coast Guard <laughs> under the uh, auspices of the U.S. Navy. I mean, I'm sorry, under the Treasury Department, except for during times of war, and then it would be under the U.S. Navy. So about two years later, on April 6, 1917, Congress declared war on Germany. And that same day, the Navy's communication center, just a second. Uh, okay. The Navy's communication center um, sent a code out through that wireless that we talked about earlier. Um, and they sent a code to, uh, to every Coast Guard cutter, every unit, every base, every, every place um, throughout the United States. And the code was Plan 1 Acknowledge. And with that code, that meant we are, you are no longer under um, reporting to the Treasury Department. You are now reporting to the Department of the Navy. You are now in the military because we are at war. So... Despite all those changes that were going on, all that new technology, all that war, a lot of life on Smith's Island was the same as before. There were no cars. There's still no cars today. There were no um, airplanes or gas masks um, or even really electricity or indoor plumbing. It's likely that there was some limited wireless uh, equipment to communicate with nearby Fort Caswell. But as a whole, there really was, it was very, still very primitive. But that's not to say that nothing ever changed on the island. So in 1915, when the Life Saving Service joined with the Cutter Service to create the Coast Guard, there were some new personnel rules. And at that time, the new rule was that men uh, who were 70 or older were required to retire. 
So it might seem like, well, who would that affect? Who wouldn't want to retire from something as difficult as the life saving station by the time you were 70 years old? But some of you may have heard of Southport's Dunbar Davis. He served in the life saving service for 50 years and he retired because of this rule. He was over 70 years old when, in 1915 when this happened. And if you haven't heard of him, I'll be talking about him in September uh, and his, his, uh, all the lives he saved in 1893 during a terrible storm. Uh, with all the changes going on in Southport and all the troops in town, uh, all the commotion, everything that was going on, the men of Smith Island were probably pretty happy that they could keep their families close, at least during the summertime. So at the lighthouse, which you see here, the families were able to live right at the station. And then uh, at the life-saving uh, station, the crew constructed homes for their families to live close by. So I can't list all the people living on Smith, Smith Island at that time. There were not very many. Um, but I do know that Captain Charlie Swan was living there with his second wife, Bessie, and their children. And in addition, he had two assistants living there, Joseph Grisillo and Edward Hewitt. And they had their families. So we don't know for sure who was uh, affected by the perceived gas attack. The Coast Guard report mentioned six men had been affected and the month end lighthouse keepers report, it doesn't mention the incident at all. But the newspapers indicated that Captain Charlie Swan and his wife may have been two of the victims. So this is Captain Charlie Swan. Now, um, during World War I, he would have been in his early 40s. So I couldn't find a photo of him um, at that age. So I found one when he was much younger and one when he was much older. So what you have to do is you kind of have to squint and average the two in your mind and you kind of get a feel for what he looked like then. His first wife, um, Marie, had passed away in 1915 from tuberculosis. She left behind six children, ranging in age from 15 years old to just five months. Now, two years later, right before the start of World War I, Captain Charlie had married his second wife, Bessie Hickman, and she brought her own four-year-old daughter, Geneva, to the family. Now, uh, Bessie was 27 uh, at that time, and during the school year, she and the children lived at the family home on West Street in Southport. But since this event took place in the summertime, Bessie and most of the seven children, who were 18 to three at that time, were living on Smith Island. So despite the terrible war, the country as a whole felt some reassurance in the fact that the fighting was happening a long way off. The Atlantic Ocean was a huge barrier and it made it hard for the enemy to reach our shores. So I'm going to play a clip of one of the most popular and patriotic songs of the time. I'm hoping you'll be able to hear it. It's a song, if you haven't, I'm, you've heard it before, but I'm just going to play a short clip of it. my whole life and I'm sure you have too and when I think of it I always thought of it as a song that was assuring you know reassuring our allies we're coming over we're gonna come help and that that was the message of the song and it was but as I was putting this doing this research and putting this all together I started to listen to that song with a different angle a different ear and I realized that this song really had two messages and two audiences that was reassuring our allies over in Europe we're coming we're going to help you over there but it also was very reassuring to the people of our country saying that telling them we're safe the the battles are going on over there the danger is over there and that that was a really reassuring message so Despite that general feeling across the country that the war was far away, in the summer of 1918, the war actually began to come closer to home. So although all of uh, Germany's, almost all of Germany's 400 U-boats were short range boats, they did build seven much larger long range cruisers that could sail from one side of the Atlantic to 
to the other. And these specialized ships, the Navy warned, may appear in American waters without warning. They also cautioned that the bombardment of coastal towns may also be done. So if you're living on the coast, that was not reassuring news. And um, attacks began occurring all along the eastern seaboard in 1918, including off of North Carolina's coast. The enemy had come to home waters. So there was, during a, one destructive three-month period, three submarines ventured as far as North Carolina. And the summer of 1918 became a very tense time period for the merchant ships that were traveling the regions because it's the shipping lane. We had to take all of our goods, all of our supplies up and down the shipping lanes along North Carolina. And many ships fell victim to the actions of these three U-boats you see before you, U-151, U-140, and U-117. So the first U-boat to arrive in North Carolina waters was U-151, and its warfare activities uh, began in June of 1918 with the sinking of five ships in five days, and you see them pictured there uh, on this screen. So it had a 94-day voyage from Germany to the U.S. East Coast and then back to Germany, and during that 94-day period, it sank 23 ships including in one 24-hour period where it sank seven merchant schooners, which was one of the greatest single-day achievements of any U-boat during the entire war. Not a great accomplishment from our perspective, but, um, and all those, these, these attacks were horrific. They at least made military sense because by destroying merchant ships and interrupting our shipping, the Germans were trying to disrupt trade and interrupt our supply chain. If we couldn't have supplies, then we couldn't continue. But then there came a surprise attack and it made no sense at all. And it, it happened pretty far from the Lower Cape Fear, but I think it's worth talking about. So it happened in the small New England town of Orleans, Massachusetts. It was one hot and hazy Sunday morning in July of 1918, just as the local townspeople were returning home from church. Suddenly they found themselves under attack by a German U-boat. So three miles offshore, a tugboat that was named the Perth Amboy was heading along the outer arm of the Cape Cod with four barges in tow. And altogether on these five vessels, there were 32 people, including four women and five children. So just before 1030 in the morning, this mysterious object passed through the water to the stern of the tug. Moments later, that same something crashed into the beach, sending sand high into the air in every direction with a roar that sounded like thunder. This was the first foreign attack on U.S. soil since 1812. And with that, over there was suddenly over here. The German U-156 emerged from the haze and inched closer to this tugboat. And for reasons that we still don't understand, it proceeded to send volley after volley in the direction of those five unarmed ships. So the Perth Amboy's captain, the tugboat, he braced for impact. These volleys were coming at him. But surprisingly, most of the shells missed their target. And instead, they pounded the ocean around the ship, sending these fountains of water up in the air. And he later, when he was talking about it, he said, I never saw a more glaring example of rotten marksmanship. Shots went wild repeatedly, and very few that were fired scored hits. But one of the shells fired from the sub's uh, deck gun crashed into the tug's pilot house. And the helmsman steering the ship felt the structure partially collapse on top of him. So he was stunned and he was shaken. He was still alive, but he dragged his broken body out of the debris. He looked over his injuries and he realized that his, his elbow was sort of hanging from his arm. He had these jagged wounds above his elbow and he was in danger of losing his arm and maybe even his life from the loss of blood. So the captain of the tugboat realized that it was only a matter of time until they scored another uh, hit and might even sink the ship. He said, we were powerless against such an enemy. All that we could do was stand there and take what they sent at us. So he finally ordered the crew to abandon ship. So they clambered into their lifeboat. So back on shore, 
there was a Coast Guard station nearby. And Captain Robert Pierce was, being, was made aware that there were heavy guns firing on a tow of barges east northeast from the station. Now, Captain Pierce was 52 years old. He was a seasoned seaman. He had worked as a lifesaver for nearly 30 years, but he had never heard of anything like this before in his life. So his first instinct, like in any crisis, was to order a surf boat dragged out of the station and launch it. But as it became clearer and clearer that there was a U-boat attacking offshore, he began to wonder what exactly his crew was supposed to do. He was not prepared to go into combat against a German U-boat. Meanwhile, curious townspeople who'd come home from church and heard the commotion began, began to spill out of their homes and come along on the beach. They saw shells skipping across the water and soaring through the sky and terrifying them. Now, one man had the presence of mind to pick up a telephone, a relatively new invention, um, and began giving a blow-by-blow -blow account of the attack as it was taking place. He called the newspaper office and told them what was happening. So at 10.40 a.m., which is 10 minutes after the first shell was fired, um, Captain Pierce of the life-saving station, before he took his crew out on the surf boat, decided to pick up um, the phone and he called the Naval Air Station that was located seven miles to the south. Now the station had these new flying boats that were equipped with bombs and they certainly had more uh, chance of doing something against the U-boat than anything the lifesavers could do. So he gave his message which would have to be translated into Morse code and sent over to the station and then he slammed the phone down, he rushed to join his men who were in the process of launching the lifeboat. He boarded last, he gave uh, one last heave off the boat, guided the craft towards the, towards the vessel, jumped into the boat, and uh, he required, as he did it, he recalled the lifesaver's unofficial creed. You have to go out, but you don't have to come back. His boat, uh, the life-saving boat, uh, met up with the lifeboat from the, tug, the tugboat, and one of the surfmen quickly transferred over to the lifeboat to give first aid to the two wounded crewmen. Remember the one whose arm was hanging off. So he wrapped a tourniquet around the arm of this injured helmsman. And later, uh, doctors credit his actions with saving the man's life and, amazingly, his arm. Uh, meanwhile, the Germans continued to shell the tugboat and the barges, and there were just families on these boats. So the families were just defenseless, and they began to abandon ship. So the life-saving crew had reached them by then. They helped them into their boats. They helped them get away. Um, one little boy became the hero of the day. He grabbed an American flag that was on his family ship and wrapped himself in it before he boarded the boat. And he announced if only he had his brother's gun, he would shoot those pesky Germans. Meanwhile, the men at the air station had begun to respond for the call for help. So at 10.50, or about 10, 20 minutes after the attack had started, the first flying boat began to fly north along the coast and close in on the U-boat U-156. So Eric, Ensign Eric Lingard, who you see here, and his two-man crew carried a single Mark IV bomb. So this plane could hold one bomb. And they had very explicit instructions, and that was that they should, be, they should release the bomb at an altitude of 1,000 feet, because otherwise the explosion could come up and impact the plane and the crew. But Lingard flew in low. He was excited. He flew in at only 800 feet. And the bombardier and his crew lined a sight directly on the deck of the U-boat they could see beneath them. And he released the bomb. And nothing happened. The bomb didn't drop. So Lingard, the pilot, circled a second time. And this time he flew just 400 feet above the boat. So low, it was practically a suicide mission for Almost certainly, the blow is going to send the men in the plane um, from their aircraft. So once again, they pulled into position, the bombardier pulled the release right over the target, and once again, the bomb failed to drop. 
so frustrated. And with the U-boat right there, they could see it. The bombardier just wouldn't give up. So he jumped out of the cockpit and on to the plane's lower wing. You can see how these wings are, and they're just right there in the open air. He climbed out on the wing before they could do anything. And just as he did it, there was a sudden blast of wind, and it hit the plane, and the man nearly slipped and fell right into the ocean below him. But somehow, miraculously, he managed to hold on. And so then gripping a strut with one hand, those wires you can see going across, he held on and holding the bomb with the other, he reached over, took a deep breath and manually released the flying boat's single Mark IV bomb. The bomb released, it fell into the sea just next to the U-boat. Fortunately, it was a dud and it didn't explode. So at that point, the U-boat uh, saw them drop the bomb, realized it didn't go off, realized the plane had nothing else to offer, and so they aimed their deck guns at the plane and began firing. Luckily, their aim with the gun wasn't any better than when they'd been firing it at the tug. So the bombardier quickly scrambled back into the cockpit and the plane uh, climbed in the sky before it could be hit. And then they stayed up at that altitude out of reach of the, uh, the U-boat's uh, weaponry, tracking the U-boat and waiting for another plane to come to their assistance. They just wanted to keep an eye on where the U-boat went. So at 11.15 a.m., 45 minutes after the initial attack, the Chatham Naval Air Station commander, uh, Captain Philip Eaton, decided to take matters into his own hands. He took off in an R-9 seaplane like you see here planning to personally sink the German raider. He was just gonna do it himself. So Lingard, who was already there, he'd been tracking and circling the sub and evading the fire from the, the submarine. All of a sudden, he sees the captain seaplane coming. It gave him uh, so much you know, renewed hope. He said, it was the prettiest sight I ever hoped to see. And now, you know, it's almost a like cliche where somebody's fighting and then, you know, another plane comes out of, out of the clouds to rescue it. But this was the first time. He said, right through the smoke of the wreck, over the lifeboats and all, here came Captain Eaton's plane flying straight for the submarine and coming in low. He said, the submarine's high angle gun was flashing too, but he came anyway. And uh, Lingard, who was the one who'd already dropped his, his only bomb, hoped that his commanding officer would succeed where he and his colleagues had failed and deliver a decisive blow to that raider below. Captain Eaton, the man you see standing here, said, as I bore down upon the submarine, it fired. I zigzagged and I dove as it fired again. And despite all that fire, Eaton was determined to position his plane above the submarine in order to hit his target. In glancing below, he seemed to have arrived just in time. He said they were getting underway, they were scrambling on the hatch when I flew over them and dropped my bomb. So remember the submarine, the U-boat, was trying to dive under the surface. It realized more planes were coming, they were in trouble, they just needed to get out of there. So they were having everyone get down the hatch and they were going to get away and go under the water where the, where the planes would not be able to reach them. So at 11.22 a.m., 52 minutes after the first attack, Eaton braced for the explosion. He dropped his bomb, waited, and instead his payload splashed at 100 feet from the sub, another dud. He said had the bomb functioned, the submarine would have literally been smashed. That was his only bomb. The sub was preparing to submerge. It was going to get away after this unprovoked attack on American civilians. Soon it would be lost forever. So in telling the story later, Eaton said at that moment he snapped. He lost his temper. He grabbed a monkey wrench from a toolbox inside his cockpit and he hurled at the Germans. And then that didn't satisfy him. He took the, the toolbox and he dumped the rest of the plane's tools as well. And then he threw the toolbox after it over the side of the plane, hoping that at least he could give one of the German sailors a concussion. The sailors on the sub realized that if he was throwing tools at them, he had nothing left to attack them with, and so they thumbed their noses and jeered at him uh, in return. So even though he, they didn't destroy the sub, Eaton and Lingard did prevent the sinking of the tugboat and any loss of life, um, and they, they, that concluded the first naval aerial attack in the Western Hemisphere. 
So all 32 of the civilian men, women, and children, as well as the life-saving crew and the naval airships survived this attack. As you can imagine, the newspapers made a lot of this attack. It was the first attack on the U.S. shore, and it was even more terrifying because it seemed to serve no military purpose. And uh, it made it more apparent that no one was safe. Future attacks like this could happen out of the blue, just like this one. It was also disturbing that all the U.S. bombs malfunctioned. Um, but there was much speculation that that was due to some tampering by German spies or German sympathizers. The headlines read, The Hun showed himself in his true colors off our coast yesterday when without warning he shelled totally defenseless craft carrying men and women engaged in peaceful pursuits. His act was as wanton in its nature as was the sinking of the Lusitania. This latest exhibition of frightfulness will only strengthen our arms for the task ahead of us. So a few weeks after the attack on Orleans, another German U-boat began to prowl the North Carolina coast. And on August 5th, the U-140, one of the ones we mentioned earlier, sank an unarmed schooner, the Stanley Seaman, about 128 miles off of Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. And the next day, on August 6, the U-boat went hunting closer to shore at Diamond Shoals, which was only 13 miles off of Cape Hatteras. So Diamond Shoals was an attractive place for the U-boat to hunt because it was a natural choke point for the American shipping lanes, the, sh the ships um, traveled the eastern seaboard to bring supplies up and down the, the coast. Uh, they had to swing around our own frying pan shoals, then lookout shoals, and then diamond shoals as they made their way along the coast. And the shoals were obviously very shallow, so the boats had to go very slowly and very carefully, but the water just off the shoals was plenty deep enough for the U-boat to maneuver. So the first ship that the U-140 came across was the Merak, an unarmed, completely defenseless merchant ship carrying a supply of coal. The U-boat emerged from the water and began firing at the ship. And the only response the Merak could do was to try to get away from the U-boat. So desperately, it tried to steam away. It used a zigzag course that it thought would be harder for the U-boat to follow. But the U-boat chased after it, firing continuously. And after about 30 shots had been fired, um, the Merak knew that an escape was impossible and they stopped trying. Meanwhile, the nearby Diamond Shoals lightship realized a ship was being attacked nearby. They could hear the artillery fire, they could see the commotion, but they couldn't make out what ship it was. But they had a wireless radio. And so because they had that, they were able to send out a transmission that an unknown vessel was being shelled near their location. The only problem with that is that the U-boat also had a radio set and they were also able to intercept the transmission. So at this point, they could tell the Merak was incapacitated. It had stopped. It couldn't go anywhere. So they broke off their attack and they turned their sights on the light ship. And they headed toward the Diamond Shoals light ship and began firing their deck guns. And very quickly, they took out the wireless room and prevented any more radio transmissions, any more notifications that they were there. Now, the light ship was totally unable to protect itself. Um, it had no weaponry, and because it was anchored into its position in the sea, it couldn't even attempt to flee like the Merak had done. The only thing they could do was to abandon ship. So there was a 12-man crew, and they lowered their lifeboat, and they escaped off of the vessel. They didn't have time to gather any supplies or belongings. They just rowed. They rowed um, west for five miles, all the while watching their ship get fired on by the, the U-boat. There were um, two officers, two radio operators, and eight others. They left about 2.30 in the afternoon is when they abandoned ship. They finally reached shore just north of Cape Hatteras seven hours later at 9.30 p.m. Similarly, the crew of the Merak also managed to reach safely. So both the ships, the Merak and the Diamond Shoals, were sunk. And, but according to a 1919 uh, Lighthouse Services Bulletin, more than 25 friendly vessels were warned away from the area by the Diamond Shoals transmission. So, as you can see, tensions were high in August of 1918 along the Cape Fear. The residents of Smith Island would have heard about the attack on the Diamond Shoals lightship, 
It made logical sense that the U-boat would methodically continue down the coast to the frying pan light ship, eventually removing all of the light ships and disrupting the crucial shipping lanes along the East Coast. Also, the residents would have read about the attack on Orleans, Massachusetts. Their fear of U-boats attacking the mainland was coming true. The Germans had already exper experimented with artillery attacks. What would they try next? Perhaps chemical weaponry. The culture of frightfulness was doing its job by sowing the seeds of fear and uncertainty. So now that we understand the context of that summer, all of the attacks along the coast, the new weapons, the new types of warfare, it becomes easier to understand how just four days later, after the Diamond Shoals attack, the people of Smith Island might have thought they were under attack from a German U-boat. We'll never know exactly what precipitated the report. The commander never issued another report. He never publicly commented on the report, and he never retracted it. Post-war post -war reviews of German military logs confirmed what the Navy had believed there were no U-boats in the vicinity that day. The U-boat that had attacked Diamond Shoals had not gone any further south. Instead, immediately after the sinking of the Diamond Shoals, it had turned west and headed back to Germany. So, Here's a theory of my own that you won't find in any history books, but when I was researching this, I, became, I began thinking about the fact that the newspapers included Mrs. Swan as one of the people who succumbed to the gas attack. And when I looked at her family's genealogy, I could see that she gave birth in January of 1919. That means at the time of the attack in August of 1918, she was three or four months pregnant. Now, there were no home pregnancy tests at the time. This was only her second pregnancy, her first pregnancy having been six years before. She might not even have realized her condition yet. And even if she did know, none of the men stationed on the island would have been aware of it. So, pregnancy is known to increase women's sensitivity to odors. The fumes from the gas passing in the water could have made her lightheaded made her faint or, or sick to her stomach. And then due to the heightened anxiety at the time, some of the men seeing her reaction might have started to feel sick as well. This is called mass psychogenic illness. And it's most commonly found in situations where there is a lot of anxiety and tension. So it's only my theory and we'll never know for sure. The official government investigation into the Smith Island incident was minimal. Five weeks after the, the attack, the Spanish flu pandemic arrived in Wilmington and as a consequence in Southport. Fort Caswell immediately went under quarantine, as did Southport. Over 500 soldiers were hospitalized at that small hospital. Seven men died. And then after that, 200 Puerto Rican laborers who had been brought to the mainland to work at Fort Bragg were brought to Fort Caswell to also be treated for Spanish flu. And over 50 of those men died. By the time that had settled down, by the time the flu had passed, the war was over. The world had moved on. 20 years later, George R. Putnam, retired commissioner of the Bureau of Lighthouses, published his memoirs. And in it, he discussed his own investigation into the incident of the supposed gas attack on the Cape Fear. Putnam had discovered that at the time of the event, there was an oil tanker on its way to Wilmington. Before entering the Cape Fear River, the captain of the tanker had pumped the oil and water out of his ship's bilges. It was a hot day, it was a southwest wind, and this explains the oil slicks that passed by Smith Island that August day. World War I ended on November 11, 1918, three and a half months after the gas attack incident on Smith Island. During that time, U-boat attacks continued along the East Coast. There were no further reports of gas being sent by a U-boat. And the odd and unprovoked attack on Orleans, Massachusetts was the only land attack on U.S. soil during World War I. No satisfactory motivation was ever discovered for that attack because two months afterwards, the U-156, the U-boat that had uh, initiated that attack, disappeared and was never heard from again. It's believed it ran into an underwater mine and sank. So no ship records were ever recovered. The Coast Guard Service, which affected many men in the Lower Cape Fear, then it was born out of World War I, 
more than 8,800 men and women served in the Coast Guard during the war. And during the brief 19 months of U.S. involvement in the war, the Coast Guard lost five ships and nearly 200 men. At the end of the war, control of the Coast Guard was returned once again to the U.S. Treasury Department, but its baptism of fire had secured its place among U.S. military agencies and prepared it for the challenges ahead during the rum wars of prohibition and the U-boat battles of World War II, some of which really did take place right off from Southport and Smith Island. So in conclusion, I just would like to say that I think World War I is often overshadowed by other events. It was closely followed by the Spanish flu pandemic and prohibition and the Roaring Twenties and then the Great Depression and then World War II. But even though it seems reasonable to look back nostalgically a hundred years ago and imagine that life was simpler than ours today, I think you'll agree with me that the men and women of the Lower Cape Fear courageously contended with challenges that were just as tough, if not tougher, than the ones we face today. All right. And now, if anybody has any questions, um, I'll be happy to try and answer them. That, that is awesome. Thanks, <laughs> Beverly. Awesome. Wow. I felt like I was there in the middle of the battle. <laughs> <laughs> Good, I'm glad you like it. We were nice and safe at home too. That's the, that's the best way to hear about battle is when you're sitting here in safety. So, um, is it- Liz, were those pictures from the, the fight at Cape Cod or just pictures in general of something that looked like it? Um, the pictures of the boats, the life-saving boats and when they were dragging people in, um, those were real pictures. And the pictures of the, the gentlemen, the, the, the military men, those were their real pictures. The pictures of the planes were the same type of the plane that they were flying, but not necessarily their plane. So largely, yes, those were real pictures. Liz, the fact that you show photographs throughout the whole presentation is very helpful. So we're here good. and we're seeing things at the same time. Thank you. Good, good. Who was that talking? I'm sorry, you're, you it's just, Ellen. I'm sorry. Ellen. Ellen. Hi, it just says admin on your, um, Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody, anybody have any questions? Any comments? Were you surprised? Pat, I think you're talking, but you, I can't hear you. Whoops. I think she's still connecting. Um, was anybody surprised? Did you know that that had gone on? Were you surprised that there was an attack on land um, during World War I? Did anybody know that? I did not know it. So this is Pam talking. Hi, Pam. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So this was uh, very enlightening for me. My knowledge was very limited. <laughs> so uh, I appreciate it. And I enjoy your enthusiasm. You <laughs> get caught up in the story. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. I love watching your arms move around when you're explaining about the trying to do the bombs and the bombs didn't work and yeah so it was good thank you very much it was I, had, I had no idea no idea at all yeah, and they, I had no idea either yeah they really don't um they really didn't um publicize it much I mean you can understand why right you, you know you don't want to cause uh, panic but also who knew you know that they you know that World War One came right to our doorstep uh, and right to, right to North Carolina. Orleans. Anything you say, we say, goes across the microphone. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Anybody? Any have any questions or comments? I really enjoyed uh, this, Dean. I really enjoyed you laying all that groundwork. I mean, that was good groundwork for World War I, not even, not just, you know, the Cape Fear, but in general, I thought that was, uh, I thought that was uh, well done going from that angle and laying out a lot of the background before we got to it. And, you know, your last comment or your last part about the, the fellow who retired uh, and said that there was a get, uh, oil drop by the, one of the ships coming in 
And, uh, you know, that makes, I kind of like your theory too. So that was well, well done. Thank you. I really appreciate that. <laughs> My theory. I think we had uh, one of, I'm not sure if he's still on. Mike Royal, uh, oh, maybe he's not on. Um, some of Char Captain Charlie's descendants, you know, still, quite a few of his descendants still live in Southport. So I don't know if they, uh, I don't know what they think of my theory that it was all due to morning sickness, but it did, <laughs> it did cross my mind. I didn't see that anyplace else. I think most of the people who were investigating were men. It didn't cross their mind that maybe it was just uh, morning sickness that led to other people uh, getting panicky, but who knows? Um, well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. It was, it was fun. I, I really enjoyed that story. Um, next month, we're going to try to do other armchair history. I'll be doing stuff about once a month. So next month I'm going to be doing, it'll be on a, August 18th, which is um, the 100th anniversary of uh, women's right to vote. So we'll be talking about uh, what overall how that happened and then um, how it happened in Southport. And then uh, after that, I'll be in September, I'll be talking about Dunbar Davis, the man I told you about. Um, from the Life Saving Station and his uh, fighting hurricanes in 1893. And then we'll, in October, we'll talk about Hurricane Hazel. Uh, yes, I thought it was a good, good timing. It'll be uh, October, about the time that, uh, that Hazel hit. So I haven't planned it out after that, but I thought those were kind of interesting. I'll be sending out at the end of the week um, what we have planned for August. Um, and tomorrow we have um, the Southport's Colorful History, and we will be doing the Crimes of the Hard House and talking about when that, that was the first major motion picture um, filmed here. And we'll be joined by Eleanor Rankin, who um, was in the movie. She was a, a local girl, she was 12 years old, and she got picked to play a young Diane Keaton. So um, she'll be telling us about her um, uh, experiences. So if you have not already signed up for that, if you send me an email, I will be sure you get the, uh, the link. I'll be sending it out this afternoon. So I think that's it. Thank you so much for your time.